Today we are going to talk about paints and props. The first thing that we will be going over is some very basic color mixing. Every time we start to paint, we want to make sure that we have a bucket of clean water with us and a wet rag. When you get your paintbrush out, you want to make sure to get it wet before you start to paint so that it cleans up easier. This tool right here is called a paint key, or some people call it a church key. You use this tool to open up the gallons of paint. The paint that we use is called Roscoe Off-Broadway paint. It's a combination between an artist's paint and a house paint. We all remember basic color mixing from elementary school. So what I want you to know is that these scenic artist paints are more akin to um, an artist's acrylic. They have a pure pigment rather than being mixed with several different inks, like what you will find at the local hardware store. In theater, we have two different ways to mix color. The first way is um, subtractive. When you are taking colors away to get to white, when we are mixing paint, that is subtracting. We would have to subtract the color out in order to get to white. Now, in lighting design, what you learn is additive color mixing because the more light you add, the closer you get to white. When you mix two primary colors together, you get your secondary colors. And when you mix a secondary with a primary color, you get what's called a tertiary color. This image is another version of the color wheel for you to look at. I want to quickly remind you of a couple of concepts. The first one being complementary colors. Complementary colors are the colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel. Hue is the basic saturated color. Tint is adding white, so it's going to make it lighter. And then shade is the version of the color where you've darkened it. There are many different types of paint brushes for many different projects. I want to address the most common paint brushes that you will find in many, many paint shops. So the first brush that I want to talk about is there on the left. It's called the lay-in brush. That brush is a very large brush for doing things like painting in large areas in painted backdrops and other types of scenery. Next brush over is called a chip brush. It's one of my favorite brushes because it's very inexpensive um, and it has those nice natural bristles. Most often when I'm basing a scenic unit, I will grab a chip brush. The next brush that you see right there is called a sash brush. So the bristles on a sash brush are synthetic rather than the natural bristles on the first two brushes. And the sash brush has that angle at the top. That angle is so that you can cut in a really nice, clean line. These sash brushes are designed for house painting to get up into the corners. The last group of brushes that you see are called Fitch brushes. Fitch brushes are a typical scenic painter's tool. Brushes come in seven different sizes, starting with a three inch on the left, going all the way down to one quarter inch size. As you can see um, on the right, the, the three main parts of the paintbrush are the bristles. Um, we have synthetic and natural, which is fairly easy to see that difference. The ferrule, which is the metal part that holds the brush together, and the handle. I cannot stress enough how important it is to clean out your paintbrushes. Murphy's Oil Soap is a really inexpensive and efficient soap to clean out your paintbrushes. Enjoy this quick demo. So I want to talk to you about cleaning brushes. Uh, it seems like it's the most obvious thing, um, but I found because uh, we don't want to take the time to get them really clean that we ruin a lot of brushes. Um, I want to talk to you really quickly. So this is the bristle of the brush. This is the ferrule. This is the handle. And then right in here, again, this is called the paint well. 
Um, this is a Fitch brush. Uh, and then this is just a little three inch chip brush. So again, handle, ferrule, bristles. And then in this one, you can see that paint well a lot more easily. Um, both of these have natural bristle brushes. And so what we're going to do is we are going to use um, Murphy's Oil Soap to clean them out. So Murphy's Oil Soap is a, a soap designed to clean hardwood floors. So since hardwood floors and um, these bristles are both uh, natural, what it does is it cleans it out and then it also conditions those fibers. Um, so the first thing you want to do is um, rinse out your brush when you're done painting. Um, if you're working on a project, uh, you want to have a bucket of water with you so that you can um, sw swish your brush down in there and get some of that paint off. Don't leave your, your brush sitting out with paint on it. Um, it'll make it really difficult, if not impossible, to clean it out. Uh, when you get over to the sink, you're obviously going to turn the sink on. You're going to get it wet. Um, and the first thing you're going to do is you're going to sit there and work it with your hands um, until you get most of that paint out. Till, um, Till you can really hardly see the paint at all and you're going to think well it's done but it's not so after you've gotten most of the paint out then you want to use the murphy's oil soap um, here at our shop i have it in this other little container um, just to make it easier to put on your on your paintbrush um, so what you're going to do is you're going to get it on there and you're going to swirl it around on your hands so what I see a lot of people doing is they'll just try to um, smush their brush off in the bottom of the sink. That doesn't really work. You have to use your hand. Um, particularly with these chip brushes, what you find is after you hang it up, um, you think it's clean and a bunch of paint then drips down to the tips of your bristles. So you just want to take your finger and you want to um, get in and get all that space in the ferrule. You want to get that cleaned out in that paint well. So you got to scrub it, scrub it, scrub it, scrub it, and swirl it, swirl it, swirl it. I like to swirl those bristles. Um, and then what I don't want you to do is turn on your water and put your brush under it like this. Um, so because what's happening is the water is going down into those bristles and it's forcing that paint into the ferrule. Um, if you get a, a ton of paint down in your ferrule, um, your uh, your bristles are going to what's called bloom and um, the, you'll never get them back together. So if you look at this brush, it is an example of a paintbrush that has sort of bloomed. Um, if you look down here at the base of those bristles, you can see that there's paint in there and it's just dried out in there. And if you look at the very end, you can see there's holes in that. There's, this is, um, you might be able to recover this, but probably not. Um, so the Fitch brushes are a little more difficult to get all that paint out of because it's very, very dense bristles. But they're also very expensive and so you need to get that paint out. Um, after you've uh, scrubbed your bristles with soap, then you want to turn the water on um, and get all of that out of there. Um, Never take your brush and smack it on the side of the sink. It's not a good idea because all you're doing is smacking that and you're gonna just um, break the ferrule from the handle, break it all loose. So that's not a good idea. What you can do is you can just kind of sling it, flip out that paint, do that to get the water out. Uh, and then you wanna hang it upside down just like this so that it can just sit there and dry. A scenic artist has many different tools and techniques that they have to learn through their time. So here's a few images of some scenic artists laying out a herringbone floor. I want you to notice that the scenic artists are standing up and um, using lining sticks that they can control from standing. And they're also using a paintbrush extension. Here is another example of scenic artists using those paintbrush extensions. The technique is called painting down, and what the scenic artists are actually using is a piece of bamboo. So today what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to do a very basic scumble. Um, just a little quick recap. Uh, this is the handle of the brush. 
This is called the ferrule, F-E-R-R-U-L-E. -E. This is called the bristles. Um, this is a natural bristle brush. Um, the other version would be synthetic, which is a man-made version. Right in here, um, you can kind of see, I don't know if you can see that, but there's sort of an opening in there, and that is called the paint well. So what we're going to use today is we're just going to use for this um, a basic white paint. I have this white paint. You can maybe kind of see it's, um, I've used it with black before, so it's a little bit mixed in, but that's okay. Um, and then we're just going to use a basic black. These are um, nothing fancy. They're from Sherman Williams, um, just a high quality um, house paint that we have right now. So. What we're going to do is um, every time you paint, you want to make sure to get your um, paintbrush a little bit wet. That's so that it cleans out easier. Um, I always want to have um, a wet rag with me. Um, anytime you're painting a set, you just want to have that in case you make an accident, make a mistake, which, you know, we never do. But if it were to happen for some reason, um, actually, the times that I make mistakes or dump out whole gallons of paint are usually the times that I forget to have a rag with me. So uh, think of it as insurance. So I'm going to get my bristles wet a little bit. Um, and then I'm simply going to take turns. Um, you can see I, I dipped my paintbrush into the white first. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're just going to start laying that paint on there in a basic X pattern. So you can see I'm alternating the way that I'm using that paintbrush. Uh, it's also called cross hatching. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sort of go back and forth. Um, I dipped into that and it, it had uh, it wasn't stirred in quite well enough. So I'm just going to pause really quickly to go ahead and um, stir that paint up a little bit more. It settled. That looks better. So when you, when you mix your paint at a hardware store or a paint store, um, if you've ever watched them do that, they put about 20 different colors of ink into the paints um, to get that exact right color that is on that color swatch that you've picked out. Um, so when, when we buy... Um, house paint and we buy black, what they use is a lot of blue. They put a lot of blue in that paint base to get it to um, to get it to that black color. Um, so whenever you mix down black that's not um, an artist's paint, it's going to have sort of that blue tint to it. Uh, and that's okay, you know, as long as you're aware of that. Um, it can be really frustrating if you want a, a warmer gray. What the blue does is it really cools down that gray color um, when you mix it with white. So this is a very, very, um, very cool gray scumble. And where it stands right now, it's... Um, very rough. So this is a very rough scumble. You can sort of still see those uh, brush strokes, which is okay when you're painting for theater. A lot of times you really do want to see those um, brush strokes. What we have is a very, very basic scumble that you could use um, sort of as a foundation for a concrete texture or um, a base coat for grout if you wanted to use grout for that. Um, but a lot of times what we want to do is have sort of a warmer feel to uh, say we're doing concrete. So what I have here is I've just, I've scooped out a little bit of Van Dyke Brown, which is that very, very dark brown that almost looks black, but it's very, very warm in comparison to black. So I've got my same brush. I'm not even going to switch brushes out. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take on this side, I'm going to go ahead and mix in some of that Van Dyke Brown. And I've got a pretty good reflection. Um, there we 
go. Uh, so one thing you could do is if you know you want a warmer gray scumble, you could just start with your Van Dyke. You don't even have to do the black at all. You could just skip and do a Van Dyke. And that's one way to warm it up and make it feel a little bit more interesting. Um, so you can see how much warmer this side is and how much cooler this side is. So the other thing that you can do that I like to do also is um, to make it have a little bit more visual interest, I'm going to add in a little bit of um, cream or yellow just to warm it up and give it a little bit more interest. Um, I have some uh, raw sienna here. Typically I would probably use just a scrap paint that was sort of cream from maybe the last show, but um, I don't have any of that on the shelf right now. So I'm just going to simply uh, sporadically throw in a little bit of this umber color. So this is just going to give it a little bit more life, a little bit more variety of color. Um, make it feel a little bit more interesting. So I've taken the brush and I've really softened that out a little bit. Softened my, um, my scumble by blending it more. Um, so I think we're in a pretty good place. You could definitely use that for a base coat for um, concrete or um, grout. Um, and then the next really basic thing that I would almost always do um, is I would do some spatter over the top. So I have this just um, lid that I'm going to use as a palette. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those colors that I had used um, for my scumble and I'm going to water them down and um, using the same exact brush. I haven't switched brushes at all. We're not going to overcomplicate it. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to take what was on my paintbrush and I'm going to water it down so that it's about uh, the consistency of like milk, some would say. And then in order to um, spatter this, what I like to do is I like to just put my hand out upside down like this and then I'm just going to tap it gently and let those water droplets sort of drop. So that would be the first round of spatter. And um, I'm sorry, on the camera you can't really even see it. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take some Van Dyke Brown um, on my already dirty brush, and I'm just going to mix that in to the mix that into the palette to the already um, wet palette. So by mixing in all of the colors and simply varying that tone a little bit. Um, it's going to help keep everything um, in the same world. If we were to do the Van Dyke right over the top, you can do that, but it will be a very drastic um, scumble, and sometimes that's what you want. Um, so I'm going to repeat that. I like to sort of spatter off to the side first a little bit, and then bring it onto your scenery. So there we sort of have that darker. Then what I think we need here is sort of a lighter scumble. So I'm actually going to try to get a little bit of that dark out of my paintbrush. And I'm going to take some white, mix that white down into that original scumble mix. So you can see. We don't want bright white or else it just will kind of look like snow, I would say. That needs a little bit more water. And then I'm going to go ahead and do the same technique, starting sort of off, and then pull the spatter onto my easy sleazy. So now we've um, done a light tone and a dark tone um, and sort of a medium tone, and we could we can leave it at that. Oftentimes, if I'm doing a really large floor, I will put in um, a warm tone spatter and a cool tone spatter 
that most audiences won't be able to decipher, but what it'll do is that yellow or that warmer yellow will pick up on the amber light that the lighting designer uses and the bluer or the uh, cooler spatter will um, pick up the blue light and it helps them um, to do that by bringing out those uh, colors that the lights are using. I do want to talk to you a bit about props or properties. The wonderful thing about props is that oftentimes the play calls for a major prop in the play. Um, and it's almost as though some props are an entire character within that story. A great example of a prop being a character is this piano that is in the play, The Piano Lesson. They have to grapple with what is going to happen with this um, beautiful historical piece that is part of their identity. So the props master is the person who is responsible for acquiring and building and creating all of the hand props for a play. For this particular piece, um, what Rochelle did was first she had to measure the piano that we had um, and get the sizes of each of those panels. And then she cut out a piece of Luan um, to replicate each panel. The next thing she had to do was she went ahead and sketched out um, imagery that was based on the stories that were told in the play. So each panel was basically telling a chapter of the history of this family. Um, then on top of that, Luan, which is a real thin um, wood material, she used clay to basically sculpt out those different stories. The next thing she did was to replicate those clay sculptures in a thin plastic using what's called a vacuform machine. The Grapes of Wrath is another great example of having a piece that is another character um, and the truck that the family drives across the country is a great example of this. It's important for props masters to stay organized. So what they'll do is they'll make a props list as probably the main document that they have. So it includes every prop that is called for in the play. Um, it, it indicates the page number, the, how many of whatever item it is, um, the character that uses it, um, notes about the props. There is a column for priority um, and that will be something that is decided based on a discussion with the director. Um, the cost which is always an estimate um, so that the show can be budgeted or see where the props master is within the budget that they have been given. And then that final column is what is the status? Where are we at with this? Um, and then you can see one of them is in sort of in the drafting stage um, and then some of them have links so that um, the item can be purchased or so that the director can go to that website and look at what the props master is um, considering for that prop. It's important for the props master to continue to communicate with not only the director but also the stage manager. Some of the props will be needed in rehearsals and the stage manager will be the one to communicate that with the props master. Another important person on the team that the props master needs to stay in communication with is the technical director as the technical director has um, a great sense of what the overall technical elements of a production are. Here at MSU, we keep our props lists on a Google Drive so that everybody in the design team has access to that information. One of the cool things about building props is that, you know, the sky is really the limit. Well, typically, actually, the budgets are usually the limit. 
But when it comes to creativity, a lot of these things are going to take more time and mental energy than they are money. One example of a prop that was super fun to build. This is the witch's staff for a production of Into the Woods. The first step was to find the wooden staff and to sort of add some rigidity to that um, top gnarled piece. The second step was to take the rope and sort of wire that rope on to help establish that gnarled wooden look to it. For the ball part, um, I happened to find a Christmas ornament in July at one of the um, craft stores. The crystal that's hanging down was sort of wired to that. Um, and then the last step was to sort of get rid of the evidence that that's rope, make it so that the audience can't really decipher that that was rope. Um, I took a simple regular tissue paper and some paint and basically sculpted that over the top of that uh, rope to um, bind that all together and make it look like a gnarled up piece of wood holding on to her um, orb. And this slide is just another example of a student having the opportunity to um, really dive in and do a fun project to build this puppet for the show First Date. You can see they are doing their research, um, sort of studying other ways other people have put puppets together, um, and using upholstery foam and some foam batting and um, some contact cement to really develop a fun little puppet. So if creating and being innovative and and using materials from day-to-day -day life to create other things entices you then I would suggest um, getting involved somehow and helping to either be on props run crew or work out in the scene shop and help build some props or you could try to assistant props master or props master a show for um, one of our productions.